This is Florida Gulf Coast University. All right, so hi. Um, I have a, uh, a book out, a new book out, just a couple of days ago called The Odd Clauses. It's about strange clauses of the Constitution, but I uh, find it difficult to read from that book, so I'm going to read uh, instead an essay about dismembered bald eagles. <clears throat> the Rocky Mountain Arsenal National Wildlife Refuge is a straight shot up Havana Street off of I-70, just east of downtown Denver, past an office depot and the national headquarters of a company called Scott's Liquid Gold. No signs point to the refuge, which was created on the site of a chemical munitions facility back in the mid-1990s, and is now home to a herd of bison, dozens of burrowing owls, and so many furry prairie dogs that a roadside sign warns oncoming traffic of their potential exing. The entrance is hardly inviting, although the officer working the booth there kindly directed me two miles north to the collection of administration buildings where I was able to find the National Eagle Repository, a macabre little division of the Fish and Wildlife Service that collects dead, bald, and golden eagles and sends them and their parts to members of federally recognized Native American tribes who need them for religious rituals and other significant ceremonies. Applying to the repository is the only way to legally get hold of any part of either eagle in the United States. The Bald and Golden Eagle Protection Act, enacted in 1940, punishes unauthorized possession of eagle parts with a hefty fine and possible prison time. At Boston University, I've taught church state law and environmental law for almost a decade. A few years ago, I spent six months traveling around the country to the cities and towns where landmark Supreme Court law and religion cases started. I wanted to see the places and meet the people involved in these controversies that I had previously known only from law books. In my travels, though, I hadn't made it out west very far, and I hadn't looked into any cases involving Native Americans. It's hard to say you know very much about the relationship of church and state in America without knowing something about how these issues play out with American Indians. After I published my road trip book, I came across the case of United States versus Wilgus. It's a case involving a white man named Sam Wilgus who, having lived with a southern Paiute family in Utah for many years, became an active member of the Native American church a peyote-based religion with nearly a quarter million followers in the United States. Several Indian Freds had given Wilgus eagle feathers over the years for him to use in religious rituals, but the police took them away during a routine traffic stop in 1998. Wilgus and his lawyer have been fighting the government ever since, arguing that the Eagle Protection Act violates his religious freedom rights. The government argues that it can't let non-Indians possess eagle feathers for two reasons. It would threaten the eagles, and it would undermine genuine Native American religion and culture. Demand for eagles and their feathers far outstrips the supply. If Wilgus gets a feather, then won't lots of other white people apply for feathers? And if lots of white people apply for feathers, then what happens to the Native Americans who want feathers but can't get them? Haven't we done enough to the Native Americans already? But then again, shouldn't Wilgus have the right to practice his religion? And what about the eagles? Does it matter that they were once on the endangered species list but were recently removed? Bernadette Atencio seemed pretty serious when I first met her, appropriate, I suppose, for someone who has worked in law enforcement at the Fish and Wildlife Service for 30 years. Dressed in her khaki FWS uniform and holding a mug that said Chicago, she also appeared pretty not that excited about talking to me. Again, no shock there. What could possibly good what good could possibly come from talking to some nerdy East Coast academic? But it turned out that Atencio was quite forthcoming. First, we talked numbers. The repository, which has been in the Denver area since 1995, receives about 2,000 dead eagles a year, two-thirds of them bald eagles. Atencio quickly compared that number to the much larger number of pending applications, over 6,000 still waiting to be filled, most of them for whole birds rather than for feathers or other parts. The eagles come from all over, generally from state, fish, and wildlife officials who either find them or are contacted by private individuals who find them. Demand has increased significantly in recent years as the word has gotten out that the repository is the place to go for legal eagles. Large feather orders in particular have increased over the past three years, but these are difficult to fill as well. Plucking takes time, Atencio pointed out. You can't always get the perfect feathers. Running a dead eagle processing agency is not a job for everybody, but for Atencio, who describes her work as a passion, it seems to be a perfect fit. 
I asked if we could take a look around, and Atencio led me on a tour of the facility. From a corridor, I was able to peer through a glass window into the cavernous science lab looking e room where they process the eagles. An enormous pallet stacked with nearly 170 identical Federal Express boxes was waiting to be taken away. Each box, according to Atencio, contained a set of loose feathers. As the relevant fact sheet explains, the repository fills orders for both quality loose feathers and miscellaneous eagle feathers. The latter consists of, quote, various size feathers, such as primaries, secondaries, tail, and plumes. There is no guarantee these feathers will be any good. As the sheet puts it, quality may vary. Next stop was the massive warehouse where Atencio and her small staff, working in their other roles as keepers of the National Wildlife Repository, keep a million and a half items of endangered species-related contraband while they figure out where to send it all. Seemingly endless rows of gigantic blue shelves stretch back the entire length of what seemed to be some sort of hangar where you might park a mid-sized jet. The aisles are arranged by creature or type of creature. One nearby was labeled the, quote, elephant, rhinoceros, yak, ostrich, zebra aisle. As I was talking to Atencio about something, I turned my head toward a different aisle to find my gaze returned by a line of tiger heads, each staring through dead eyes out of plastic bags at me. Several leopard, or maybe cheetah, heads were next to the tigers. I asked if she had any pandas around, and mercifully Atencio said she didn't have any of those. Since I had a camera with me, I asked if I could take some pictures. Atencio said no. For security reasons, pictures are not allowed in the warehouse. But to my surprise, she said we could go into the eagle processing room, and I could take pictures there. Perhaps, she added, some eagles might have arrived that needed processing. I could watch that and take pictures. Really, I said. Really, Atencio said. Sweet. <laughs> it's kind of hard to explain what a dead, bald eagle smells like. It's not as bad as you might think, but it's not great either. Maybe it's kind of like a dead fish. Not a slab of sashimi-grade tuna, of course, but also not like something that's been decaying on the beach for a week. Probably a dead eagle smells a lot like a freshly dead chicken. But then again, I don't know what a freshly dead chicken smells like. Probably it smells something like a dead fish. <laughs> One thing is for sure, though. Processing a dead bald eagle sends lots of tiny fluffy feathers into the air. It was practically snowing dead eagle feathers in the room while I watched two people from Atencio's staff work through a few newly arrived birds. It was a little disconcerting that the two men working with the birds were wearing face masks and full-length protective suits while I stood there trying to breathe as little as possible so as to not contract any eagle carcass fluffy feather-borne diseases, whatever those might be, if indeed such diseases exist, and how could they not? <laughs> the first box of eagles the staff went through was from South Carolina. Immediately, Atencio told me these would almost certainly be bald eagles, and they would probably be on the small side. The word she actually used was dinky. A young man named Adam, who had been working at the repository for a while before heading off to college, unpacked the box and took out what seemed to me to be a not entirely dinky bald eagle. He removed the bird from a plastic bag and started examining it. The eagle was in better condition than I had expected. Its face was bloody, and it had a large wound right in its belly, but it was completely intact, and the feathers looked decent. Adam extended the enormous wing and combed through the feathers, explaining that each eagle has 10 primary feathers and 14 secondary feathers. He counted them all up and checked the quality of each one. The wing was looking good, and so was the other one, but when he got to the tail, there was a problem. Ooh, what happened there, Atencio asked. The tail was missing six of its 12 feathers and would have to go. Adam took a huge red bolt cutter and chopped the tail off in one click. And then he took the tail and put it in the trash can. That will need to be replaced. Meanwhile, on the eagle processing table opposite from where Adam was set up, longtime repository specialist Dennis Wilst was hard at work on another South Carolina bird, which was notable for its extremely well-preserved head. This guy is amazingly fresh, Wilst announced to the room. He still has an eyeball. You don't often see that. The eyeball might have been fresh, it didn't look that fresh to me, but what the hell did I know? <laughs> but the head itself was a different story. Whoever had found the eagle had probably put it in a freezer right away, thus the fresh eyeball. But the ice in the freezer had soaked the head and turned it into a, quote, big mess. Wilson Atencio discussed how to proceed. 
If they put the head into the freezer immediately, the eyeball would stay fresh, but the rest of the head would be compromised. On the other hand, if they tried to dry the head out first, the eyeball might suffer. After some back and forth, they decided to try and dry the head out for a while. Wilst retrieved a pair of bolt cutters, chopped off the head, and put it aside. I, of course, snapped a picture. As for the rest of the bird, again, the wings were fine, but the tail was, in Wilst's words, not looking too good. This time, Wilst cut off the wings and put them aside to dry, disposing of the rest of the bird, except for the head, of course, in a nearby trash can. I stuck around a little longer to see Wilst pull out a slightly bigger Minnesota eagle from a box and admire its pretty golden claws, which Atencio told me could be used as a replacement for some other bird's bumblefoot infested feet. I nodded my head as though I knew what bumblefoot was. <laughs> Foot was. <laughs> Honestly, I could have watched this go on all day long, but I had stayed enough and I didn't want to wear out my welcome. I thanked everyone and took my leave. On my way out of the refuge, I dodged prairie dogs with my rented Hyundai and considered the Wilgus case. I still did not quite know what to think about it. Thank you.